I tell you, sometimes I think I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 17, looking at a, an extremely important portion of Scripture, Acts chapter 17. We'll be looking at verses 22 through 25, the unknown God. And we're surrounded by a world that has before them an unknown God, to whom someday they will, in fact, give an account. Acts chapter 17, tonight we'll be looking at verses 22 through 25. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you are the true and living God, the God who has revealed himself. You do not have to be unknown, because you have revealed yourself. We don't have to go out and make up a God of our own imagination. We don't have to go out and scramble around wondering if there is a God. The creation itself points to you, that we are accountable to you, even to know about your eternal Godhead and power. And so all men are without excuse. Father, we pray tonight that as we once again look into the Word of God, you might encourage our hearts, that you might bless us as we examine the Scriptures so that we might know the one who is the only true God, the one who is the living God, the one who is the Creator God, the one who has given to all things life and breath, the one who has made all men of one blood, the God of the universe, the God who is our God, our personal God, the one who cares about us, the one who intervened in history, who broke into history that he might redeem his creation which had fallen as a result of sin. So, Father, we pray for your blessings on our study tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start reading in verse 18, which is where we had our text last week. Acts chapter 17, verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, which is Mars Hill in Athens, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is whereof thou speakest? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Fascinating presentation the Apostle Paul makes. He had been speaking up to this point about the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection. Christ dying for our sins, being buried, rising again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the content of the gospel. That's what Paul says is the content of the gospel in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 50, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The gospel by which we are saved. We find that people were not responding because they didn't have a certain foundation that they needed to have. Paul is vexed as he sees all the idolatry in the city of Athens. That's what moved him to action. We talked about being moved to action. And what is it that moves you to action? And now we find that he is challenged. This is a strange God that you seem to be setting forth. We've never heard about this God. This is really something that we need to take you up where the professionals are. The people who talk about the new stuff all the time. Let's see how this fits into the all the new things that we've been, been hearing about. And so they take him to Mars Hill, to the Areopagus. We'll be talking about that a little more in just a moment. But well, we saw that because Paul was moved to action by the Spirit of God, and Paul didn't waste time, and because Paul was observant, he had actually walked through all the different shrines on top of the Acropolis. You think about that. He had wandered around and actually read the inscriptions to each of these pagan gods. Otherwise, he would have never known that there was there was actually a, a pedestal there 
with no statue on top of it. And it said, to the unknown God. He had gone around and looked at him one after another after another. It had vexed his spirit. He saw the incredible amount of superstition, the incredible amount of idolatry, the incredible amount of paganism. And it vexed him. Here, the center of the cultural world in Athens. And they didn't know the one thing that was important to know. They didn't know the true God. They had everything else except the one thing that's needful. It's like having a gigantic mansion filled with all kinds of beautiful antiques and furniture, filled with vaults filled with gold and jewels and silver, Lincoln Continentals and Cadillacs and Mercedes Benz and Lamborghinis and other things out there in the driveway, rolling hills covered with beautiful meadows and Arabian horses, your own private airport with a beautiful Learjet sitting out there, a staff that waits on you hand and foot, and yet you're dying of cancer. You don't have the one thing that you need. That's what Paul saw when he saw Athens. All the wealth, all the grandeur, all the glory, all the beautiful architecture, all the beautiful art, all the wealth, all the intellectuals, they had everything that they needed except the one thing that they really needed. He was an observant man. And because he was prepared, and because he had applied creative application. That's very creative what Paul does here. I hope you notice that. We just sort of take it for granted. Oh yeah, that's what he said. That's incredibly creative application of his immediate pagan surroundings. Can you take the immediate pagan surroundings that you see around you and begin at that point and share Christ? Jesus always started with the things that were immediately surrounding him. He talks to the woman at the well, and so what does he talk about? He talks about water. He talks to Nicodemus at night, and Nicodemus, he's telling him about being born again and Nicodemus says well you know I know you have to to be born how can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb be born and Jesus starts at that point and he takes him through the new birth our Lord Jesus Christ took what he had at the immediate setting and then he applied it and gave spiritual application so it would open the eyes of his listeners they understood the temporal now he's showing them how the temporal expresses the eternal so Paul is doing here on Mars Hill He's using the same type of, of method that Jesus used. And because Paul was spiritual in his motivation for action, and because he was willing to confront, now we're going to see tonight how, how just how willing he is to confront. He was willing to take the bull by the horns when faced with people who'd spent their entire lives debating philosophy, theology, and new ideas. Therefore, he made a powerful impact. And it was because of that that the church got started. These people, we talked about them last week, they're a very interesting group of people. They're like the university setting. We'll talk more about that tonight, too, Lord willing. There are those wolves that many Christians send the young people into at the secular universities, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what these people, these philosophers, on the top of Mars Hills were like, Hill was like. They always wanted to hear something new. They could never get to the truth that way. You cannot get to the truth through intellectualism. You cannot get to the truth through philosophy. It's one of the great mistakes that Thomas Aquinas, one of the great, quote, saints of the Roman Catholic Church made back in about 1250, considered one of the brightest minds that Roman Catholicism ever produced, wrote a book called Summa Theologica, The Highest Theology. And he said that man had fallen in every way except in his intellect and that man could reason his way back to God. And man didn't reason his way back to God. And that's proved here, as we look at these philosophers, these Epicureans, these Stoics, these people who spent their time in nothing else but to hear something new, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You cannot reason your way back to God. And as a result, the rise of scholasticism took place in all the perverted theology that we see in the Catholic Church today. It's interesting, because that context ties you in with apostasy, and that's what we see happening by those who reject revelation and go to reason instead of revelation. We talked about these people having 
being a, a group that has no background in the scripture, they outnumbered Paul. They could throw questions at him from every direction before he could answer the first question. It's a group that had scoffers and hecklers. They call him a babbler. Others mock him as you get down to verse 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we'll hear you again of this matter. They were hostile, professional debaters. And that's the context in which Paul finds himself. We talked last week uh, a lot more about rewards for standing for the truth. Rewards for presenting the gospel of Christ. Rewards that God is going to give to us someday if we are faithful with that which he has entrusted to us. Now that brings us tonight to our text. We see the Apostle Paul, it says they brought him unto Areopagus. That's Mars Hill in Athens. We find out that it's Mars Hill just down in verse 22. It's the same thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens. The Areopagus, another name for Mars Hill. The word Areopagus means the hill of Ares. Ares was the Greek god of war. He's the equivalent of the Roman god Mars, who was also the god of war. Mars is the Latin name of the same name Ares, which is Greek. Mars Hill is the name of a bare, rocky place that is 377 feet high, immediately northwest of the Acropolis, which is 512 feet high and separated from it by a narrow split of rock. Steps are cut into the living rock that leads to the summit where benches were cut out of the living rock as well. Mars Hill was the court of the city fathers. They met in that place to determine all political, educational, and religious matters. Thus, it was very appropriate for Paul to be brought to this place where he had again the opportunity to speak to the leaders of the city as well as the, what we would call the new stuff freaks. But there's something more important than even this that's going on in our text tonight. I hope you noticed it as we read verses 18 through 25. Something even more important. This morning, you know, we were talking about spiritual warfare in which we're engaged. Does anybody remember this morning's message? I have one hand, two hands, three, four. Okay, well, do you remember I was talking about spiritual warfare, putting on the spiritual armor, the battle that we were fighting? I hope you can remember from morning to evening because it's very important for what we're going to look at tonight. Very important for what we're going to look at tonight. It's appropriate that Paul does here in Acts chapter 7 where he is challenging the pantheon of Greek gods it's exactly what Moses was doing in Exodus chapter 7 as he challenged the gods of Egypt. That's what's going to happen. Each one of the plagues is against one of the gods of Egypt. He's there against the sorcerers of Egypt, the ones who run the operation for the gods of Egypt. Paul is doing the same thing. The parallel is uncanny. But notice the difference. In Exodus chapter 7, both God and Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. And there were no converts. In Acts chapter 17, we discover that some mock and others are curious, but some are irresistibly drawn to salvation. In Exodus chapter 7, God's purpose was to judge Pharaoh and judge Egypt. They'd already had the truth for 400 years, and they had rejected the truth. In Acts chapter 17, God's purpose was to open the door for the gospel at the cultural, educational, artistic, legal, and economic center of the Greek-speaking world, Athens, the capital. Although the armies of Rome had conquered Greece, the language, culture, and philosophy of Greece had conquered Rome. It was through the intelligentsia of the capital that God brought Paul, a highly trained intellectual Jew, to preach the gospel. What God trains you for, he uses you in, if you will allow him to use it. And so what we see Paul doing here, he's engaged in spiritual warfare at the very heart of Greek culture. Rather interesting. You can see the Acropolis from the Areopagus. And why is that important? Talking spiritual warfare, remember. You see, the Acropolis was dedicated to Athena, the goddess of war. <laughs> and you can see it from where Paul was speaking. I suspect he pointed to it on occasion. So we're talking in the biblical sense of spiritual warfare. The Acropolis at Athens was covered with splendid temples. 
And you know something? Just like the God of the Bible has many names describing his character, and we've studied some of them, like Yahweh, which is his covenant name, or Elohim, that's the name that speaks of him with his great power, or Yahweh Sabaot, the Lord of hosts, the one who is the head of the armies of heaven, or the Lord, our shepherd. We covered many of them. Remember, I did a whole series on the names of God. But here in Athens, Athena also had various names describing what the Greeks saw as her various traits. It was here on the Acropolis that the famous sculptor Phidias, who died about 432 BC, made a colossal statue of ivory covered with gold of Athena Promachos, the goddess who fights in front. <laughs> and Paul is challenging the goddess who fights in front, the goddess of war. It's spiritual battle that's going on here. I hope you get the point. This is sort of like Mount Olympus where the gods dwelt invisibly, but here we find all the gods of the Greeks are gathered together. Statues all over the place, temples all over the place, the great temple to Athena standing there in the middle, and you can still see it today. It was here that the Greek gods had gathered together that Paul came to do spiritual battle. It was here that the gods and goddesses of war had preeminence that led the, and led the way into the spiritual battle. Remember, it's Mars Hill, god of war. Ares the Greek name, God of War. Athena, the goddess of war. It's at the site of the battle where the gods and goddesses who are in charge of war are there. And it's there that Paul is making his presentation. It was here that Paul came to do battle, not in some obscure pagan temple with a senile old priest mumbling about. Here he was confronting the best and the brightest. He, here he was confronting the intellectuals. Here he was confronting the people who knew everything about everything. And the God of the Bible won a victory in the heart of enemy territory. And most significantly, notice the God that Paul presents. I hope you pick up on this point. Paul presents the Creator. He'd been talking about Jesus and the resurrection. That's the heart of the gospel. But here he's coming to do battle. And so the God he presents is the God who is the creator. He presents the God who made everything. He presents him as the supreme God over all the gods. And he's standing right across from where all those temples and all those idols and all those pedestals are located and where the great chief goddess Athena, her temple is located with her gorgeous statue made out of ivory and gold. And he comes to do battle. I hope you see that. You know, as we look at this text, we need to remember, as Paul create, presents the Creator God, who's the supreme God over all gods, none of those other gods could exist if there was not a Creator. Now, from the Christian perspective, we know that God even created them because they are all demons who are manifesting their supernatural powers in subordination to his omnipotent power. We talked about that this morning and last week. You see, the gods of the pagans are the fallen angels of the Bible who followed Lucifer in his rebellion against God. Paul's making that point here. We'll pick up on it a little bit later as we get in farther into the passage. But Paul's making that point. This is the supreme God. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. The Lord, the Kurios, the one who's over all of them, because he's the creator God. That's why he wins. The gods of the pagans are the fallen angels of the Bible who followed Lucifer in his rebellion against God. It's the gods of the pagans that are at war with the true God. Hence, it is appropriate that Mars and Athena are prominent in the location where God himself has chosen to do battle. He does battle on their home turf. God is not afraid of his creatures and he is not afraid of his creation. Notice something else also here in the text. The God of the Bible is to the Greeks this true God is to the Greeks an unknown God. As over the centuries mankind has followed demonic deception 
for example, in Genesis 6, before the flood, where we find that men have turned aside to Satan and followed him. And they intermarry with those who have rejected God. The sons of God came under the daughters of men. That's not angels cohabiting with women, although some have suggested that. I've preached on that subject before. And then we find Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10, again, rebellion against the true God. That's after the flood at the Tower of Babel. Very soon, the true God is only a dim memory in the minds of those who have turned away from him, those who have polluted the truth that God has given to them. Even so, as we look here in our text, the Greeks had followed the gods of their own hands, and they had thus lost the knowledge of the true God. Did you catch what Paul said in verse 23? I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, and here's the phrase, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. They had lost the true knowledge of the true God. They were ignorant. They knew there was something else out there. Something in the back of their mind told them, I'm missing something. Something in the back of their mind told them, you know, I, I know there's got to be something else be what I, be because of what I see around me here. There are people all around you here in the United States that know that there is something missing. There has to be something more than just this material world that we see. Are you ready to declare unto them the one true God whom you ignorantly worship? There are people all around you who are going to churches where the gospel is not preached. There are people all around you who are going to mass and bowing down in front of statues. There are Hindu temples right in our general area here. There are Buddhist temples. There are Muslim mosques. There are all kinds of people around us who don't know the true God. Have you ever walked down and stood in front of one of those places and began to preach the true God, the creator God of heaven and earth? It's a scary thought, isn't it? You know, right down Haddon Avenue, as you go down into Patterson, there is a mosque down there. As you go down on your left-hand side, you'll see a, a Muslim education center. It's in a black neighborhood. Dangerous for you as a white man to go down there, right? White woman. Scary. Think Paul Mars Hill. That's what he was doing. Kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, we think, yeah, that was a, that was neat. That was a cool culture. I mean, they, he went down there. He preached on top of this little rock someplace out there, and a bunch of weirdos were standing around him. Listen, Paul was doing spiritual battle at the heart of the Greek religion. Be sort of like trying to preach the gospel standing in the courtyard around that big, huge, square building in Mecca. <laughs> think you'd get away with it? don't think so. Just think Mars Hill. So the Acropolis was very appropriately right next to the Areopagus. The Acropolis was dedicated to Athena, the goddess of war. We find the gigantic statue there. We find that later another little shrine was made called Athena uh, and I have lost the my place here. <laughs> uh, here we go. Athena Nike. You heard of Nike shoes. That means victory. Athena, the goddess of victory. The magnificent Parthenon was built around that statue by Phidias. Later that stately entrance, the Prophylai, was completed. Magnificent place by the time Paul gets there. In his famous 1878 work on Greece, J.P. Mahaffey states, quote, There is no ruin all the world over which combines so much striking beauty, so distinct a type, so vast a volume of history, so great a pageant of immortal memories. All the old world culture culminated in Greece. All of Greece culminated in Athens. All Athens in its Acropolis. All the Acropolis in the Parthenon. Pantheon is at Rome, Parthenon is at Greece. I hope you get the point. Here was where Paul came 
and he presented the Creator God. In Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, Paul tells us that all men everywhere are accountable to the true God. Three chapters Paul gives to that to show that all are guilty so that by the time he gets to the end of chapter 3 he can say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because they've known something about the true God and they have rejected the true God. In Romans chapter 1 they are accountable to him because of the light of are you ready? Because of the light of creation. That's where Paul starts in his message here in Acts 17 when he gets to the, uh, to the top of Mars Hill. They are accountable to him because of the light of creation. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, and what are those last words? So that they are without excuse. Paul is talking to pagan Greeks. Paul is talking to people who only have the vaguest, faint memory of the original revelation that God gave to Adam and Eve and then gave to Noah. They've only got a, a vague, faint memory of it. But Paul says they can see creation all around them. And so they're without excuse and so Paul starts his message with the God who is the creator of all things. And then he also speaks about their conscience. In Romans chapter 2, Paul says all men are accountable because of their conscience. Verses 14 through 16. For when the Gentiles, are we talking Gentiles here? Athens? Part of the Greek culture? Yes, we're talking Gentiles. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, oh, they didn't have that special revelation, which he's going to get into in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, he says, you know, they're also accountable because of the law of God. But Romans chapter 2 is dealing with conscience. Creation chapter 1, conscience chapter 2, special revelation chapter 3. For in the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. They know certain things are right and wrong. You know, every society where you go around the world, whether you're in the middle of the jungles of Africa, whether you're in ancient China with uh, all of its great culture, no matter where you are around the world, you will find there is a certain order to things. And there are certain things that are built into men so they know certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And they have rules that dimly reflect the law of God. They don't have the law of God anymore. They've rejected all that that God had given to them ahead of time. But they still have a conscience. They know some things are right and they know some things are wrong which show the work of the law written in their hearts. They've got it inside. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. When they do something wrong, you know what? They still have a conscience. When they do something wrong, their conscience is pricked. Now you can harden your heart as Pharaoh did. You can sear your conscience as Peter talks about so that you no longer feel those pricks of conscience when you continue doing the same sin over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and finally it gets to be scar tissue where you don't feel it anymore. But all men are given the light of creation. All men are given the light of conscience. And it will either excuse them or it will accuse them in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Book of Life gets opened in the book of Revelation and the books, plural, are opened wherein every man is judged according to their works. They knew what was right and they chose not to do it. They knew what was wrong and they chose to do it. They saw that there was a true and living God out there and they rejected him and turned aside to the gods of wood and stone and gold and silver and iron and bronze. Paul's talking to the Gentiles here. And that's why Paul starts in his, with cre creation in his presentation. That's why the devil, even today, fights so hard against the doctrine of biblical creation. If the devil can win this one point in the minds of men and women and teenagers, college students and high school students, 
junior high students, boys and girls, all the way down into those elementary levels and even before that, where they're beginning to teach that man's not made in the image of God, he's just an animal, so it doesn't matter if he's homosexual. And after all, you little teeny kids, you ought to be able to act this out. And they have stories even for preschoolers where there are two daddies in the story or there are two mommies in the story. They want to get them away from the biblical concept of creation. God made one man for one woman for life. You know where it goes back to? It goes back to the issue of creation. Every one of those perversions that we see in our society around us today goes back to the issue of creation. Everything you find that's going wrong in the world today goes back to Genesis chapters 1 and following. God's word is truth from the very first verse. And the devil doesn't want you to believe it. If he can undermine the foundation, if he can pull out the rug from under you in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, he wins the battle. He's got you by the neck. He wins your children. He wins your grandchildren. He has them so that they will not be able to follow the one true and living God. He's got them where they're walking into darkness and they end up just like the Greeks who were there on Mars Hill. That's why Paul starts with creation. You see, if the devil can win on that point in the mind of man, he's free to make all the gods of his own design. He can have the God of eternal matter. Did you realize there are only two possibilities? Either God is eternal or matter is eternal. Those are your only two options. Because something doesn't come out from nothing. Unless there's a creator who makes it, you can't have evolution taking place. If you reject God, you must come to the conclusion that matter is eternal. Whether you use a big bang or whatever else you want to do, you start with something and you say that something is what is eternal. And for the evolutionists, it's matter all bunched up in one teeny little ball about the size of a golf ball that suddenly explodes and becomes all the universe that we see now. And what had enough power to blow apart something that size with all the weight of the matter of the universe in it? It would take more energy than it contains in itself to blow it apart. Or you start with an eternal God. Those are your only two choices. You have no other choices. You start with eternal matter or you start with the eternal God. But if the devil can take you away from creation, he can give you the God of matter resulting in random evolution. He can have for you the God of punctuated equilibrium, Stephen Hawking. He can have the God of panspermia, whereby someplace somewhere else in the universe, the seeds of life were sent across the universe and landed on earth and developed into all that we have today. He can have the God of alien invasion. It's aliens who came here and started life on this planet. And you know, there are people who believe that strongly with all their hearts. I've seen some films on that, which are based on that premise. He can give you the God of spiritism and demon possession, higher supernatural beings, Creation is the first and foremost bulwark and barrier against the false gods of this world. You need to understand that, folks. That's why I have had such a, a passionate emphasis on creation since I've been here at this place, and for many years before that. Because that is the foundation. And that is the reason we see what's happening in our society today. That's the reason that there are no young people in this church. It hasn't been emphasized. They haven't been given the tools that are necessary to sporadically here and there and here and there, you know. A few things here and a few things there. And then they equate that with the Bible stories and they get to school and they say, this is real science. Well, anyway, we need to be arming our young people. We need to be hammering it into their minds and consciences we need to be arming them with the evidences and the arguments for the truth. The devil's people know that this is the battlefield of our time. Paul grounded his presentation to the cultural intellectuals of his day on the doctrine of creation. Those were the cultural intellectuals that met there on Mars Hill. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. And believe me, those guys who believe in all those weird evolutionary theories that I just listed a few of them for you there, 
They are way too superstitious. You have to take an awful lot of jumps of faith to get to the conclusions that they reach it at because they want to reject the true God. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. And here he has it. Here's what I'm telling you about the unknown God. The God that made the world and all things therein. That's the creator. Notice the second thing that Paul talks about here in this passage. The second thing was that Paul was not ashamed to state that the biblical God was sovereign over all the other gods, down here in verse 24, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He is the sovereign God. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. There's nothing in heaven that's greater than he is. There's nothing on earth that's greater than he is. You can put them all together and he's still greater than all of them. He's a sovereign God. Never be ashamed to present the biblical God. Now I know that people all around you and even in churches hate the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. You see, there are so many out there in the Arminian camp especially that want to make God sort of subject to man's free will. That's certainly not the way Paul presented him here, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. He's not only the creator, he's sovereign. That means he's sovereign over all your gods. He's sovereign over you. He's sovereign over everything that you can see. I suspect that as the Apostle Paul was preaching this, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He may have spread his hand up to the heaven and showed the heavens and then spread it down to the earth and they're looking down at the great city of Athens scattered and spread out beneath them there, beneath the, the Acropolis and Mars Hill. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he probably pointed over there to the, to the Acropolis and the temples over there. He's the Lord. He's over all of those gods that you see over there. Notice third. Paul expresses the transcendence of God. God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now remember the context here. He's not standing in the jungle somewhere when he says that. He's standing where he can see the most magnificent temple in the world at that time. The true God, the one who's the Lord of heaven and earth, that means he's over all this stuff, he doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. Rather interesting. Paul says that after the temple of Jerusalem had been destroyed and the day of Pentecost has already taken place. The transcendent God is everywhere. Oh, I know our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But he says, this God is not restricted to a location. He's transcendent. God sees in the dark. Thou, Lord, seest me. He is so big, he can see every man, every woman, every boy, every girl on this planet. He is with us here in this room. He sees us here in this room. He knows what's going on in this room. He knows what's running through your mind right now. For those of you who are watching on the internet, he knows what's running through your mind right now. Whether it's thoughts of frivolity, thoughts of boredom, thoughts of, I think I'll run out and get a drink. I'll ignore the message for a few minutes. It won't make any difference. It doesn't matter to me. He sees it. He is a transcendent God. Are you watching over the internet right now? What are you doing? What are you thinking about? You who are here. He's a transcendent God. Did you get that from that passage? He dwells not in temples made with hands. He's everywhere. What Paul is doing, he is making a direct insult to the most beautiful temple in the world that they could see a few hundred yards away. He's not made in temples made with hands. He doesn't dwell in temples be made with hands. Look over there. You see that fantastic temple over there? You see all those smaller temples over there? You see all those shrines over there that have all got their statues of little gods in them? The God of heaven and earth doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He doesn't need that ivory. He doesn't need that gold. He doesn't need all those priests. He doesn't need all those jewels. He doesn't need all those offerings. He dwells not in temples made with hands. The fourth thing that we notice out of the passage is Paul not only puts God as distinct from his creation, but he puts God as independent from his creation. Distinct 
but independent from his creation. God does not depend on us. You know, the Greek gods depended on their worshipers. Our God doesn't depend on us. God doesn't need us like the Greek gods needed the sacrifices to eat. And if the people didn't bring the sacrifices, the Greek gods would zap the people if they didn't get their lunch. That's a weird kind of God to worship. You Did you see that? Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. He's not only distinct from his creation, he is independent from his creation. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything. You know, when, when we give our offerings on Sunday, we think, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving something to God. No, you're not. You're merely distributing God's personal resources in the way that he said to do it. Because you don't own anything. I don't own anything. We have this weird thought in our mind that we own what we've got. We don't own anything. We're not owners, we're stewards. That's how the New Testament presents us. What you have is a stewardship. The question is, how are you using the stewardship that God has entrusted to you? Are you a faithful steward who is multiplying it in the spiritual realm for the glory of God? Not merely in the temporal realm, which is what we all focus on, where we garner stuff, where we accumulate stuff, where we hoard stuff, where we have it sitting around us, where we can sit and look at it. Oh, oh, oh look at all they've got. Man, look at my bank statement this month. Mm, flipping through all those stocks and bonds that we got. Or flipping through title deeds to all these properties that we own. You're not an owner. You're a steward. And when you give to God, it's not because God needs something. It's because God has entrusted you with a stewardship to accomplish His purposes on earth. You're merely working for Him. You're distributing in the way that most perfectly brings Him glory, in the way that accomplishes the most good, in the way that most perfectly furthers the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God doesn't need anything. And when we're not faithful with the stewardship he gives us, you know what? He can easily take it and give it to somebody else. Like the guy who buried his talent in the earth. And Jesus said, take it away from him and give it to the guy who started with five and now has ten. He said, but he, Lord, he's already got ten. It doesn't matter. Give it to him. So that doesn't seem fair for the guy that has all that stuff to get more. God isn't working on the basis of fairness. He's working on the basis of faithfulness. Not fairness faithfulness what is he doing with us God doesn't need anything like the Greeks God needed finally fifth notice that God is the source of life and by extension everything that we have since it all goes back to living things that's us his creation copying their creator in creativity by making all the things that they could see from the top of Mars Hill they couldn't even see from the top of Mars Hill if God hadn't given them life. They couldn't even see the buildings that had been built. They couldn't even see the temples that had been made. They couldn't even see the ox carts down there. They couldn't even see the pots and the jugs that people were selling and buying in the marketplace. They couldn't see all the nice and fancy clothes that was down there. You see, the creature copies the creator in creativity. And that's what Paul says here in this phrase. See, you give it to all life and breath and all things. And I suspect that Paul waved his hand over the city of Athens at that point. He's not only given you the life and the breath that you have right now. He's given us all things. Look around this room. That table sitting up against the wall there. It's a reflection of the Creator. Somebody creatively made the plans for that, creatively made the, the various machines that made that, creatively made the various materials that made that, creatively put together those various materials, creatively sold it to some store somewhere, and then through the creativity of that store's advertisement and carrying the stock and so on, we bought it. The chairs you're sitting on. It gives life and breath and all things. God is the source of life, and by extension, he is the source of everything that we have, since it all goes back to living things, people copying their creator and creativity by making all the things that they could see from the top of Mars 
hill. Only the Creator can give life. It doesn't happen by chance. Seeing He giveth all life and breath and all things. My time is almost up. Next week, the Lord willing, as we move into the next part, I want to talk about how Paul points to the creation of man as the capstone of his argument. Oh, you can read those verses right now if you want to. Just read ahead a little bit. He's going to talk about man as the capstone of his argument, and in the process, he's going to make a very up-to-date scientific statement that was only, quote, discovered in our modern era. We didn't know it before, but Paul makes that statement on Mars Hill. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that Paul was prepared. He was observant. He was willing to confront. He was willing to take on even the biggest guns that that day had. In the center of intellectualism, in the center of culture, in the center of art, in the center of wealth, in the place where he challenged the very gods of that culture as Moses did with the gods of Egypt because he knew that you were the true and living God and nothing happens apart from you you're the sovereign God you're the Lord of heaven and earth and if you wanted him to die at that point he would die and if you wanted him to live at that point he would live and that's where you took him because the people grabbed him and dragged him to Mars Hill and said we want to hear more about this and they dragged him to the place where all the intelligentsia were where all the judges were the people who were in charge of all the religious and political affairs all the cultural affairs of the city that's where they met and they said tell us more about this God and Paul who had been trained and used his training well presented the God of the Bible the creator of heaven and earth and all that therein is. Father, make us a prepared people. Make us an observant people. Make us a ready people. Make us a people who are courageous and unafraid to share the gospel of Christ. Make us a people who present winsomely and convincingly that there are touchstones that are even still remembered by people in our culture whereby we can connect with them and point them to the true and living God the one who has provided salvation for them through Jesus Christ, your Son, who died for our sins, who was buried, who rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, because He is the Creator. And to Him we all owe allegiance. Father, again we thank You for Your Word and pray for Your blessings on it tonight as it goes forth. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>